So hello, I am Jonathan Riddle, um, and I work on stuff in KDE and stuff in Kubuntu. Um, when I was at university many years ago, I learned, they gave us slides about how to program, how to uh, write a Java program that puts a button here and there, but I could not work out how you went from writing a Java program that put a button on the screen uh, to writing an actual application that people could use. And the only way for me to learn that was to look at some existing programs. And the only way to do that was to join an open source community. KDE is an open source community. It's the original one that makes, um, is focused on uh, consumer software, end user software on the Linux desktop. So KDE makes a desktop and a whole bunch of applications that are the actual applications that users care about. And those of us who make distributions uh, take those applications, put them into a distribution. So I make uh, Kubuntu, which is part of the Ubuntu project, um, and just has the selection of programs that come from KDE. I went to a talk back in the day at university at a conference like this. IBM were giving a talk. And the person from IBM said, well, we have put Linux on the server. And now people are asking us, when will Linux take off on the desktop? And they were expecting that to happen over the next few years. So I thought, yeah, I'm getting into KDE, making community-made software for the desktop. Um, this is a good career. So I decided to make that my career, because clearly Linux on the desktop was the future. And within five years, everybody would r be running it. How many people are running Linux on the desktop? Yeah, yeah, not a bad crowd here. So about 50% of this crowd, and but this is quite a special crowd. Um, and I love you all very much for that. But of course, outside this room, uh, very few people. So it has not quite taken off, which is a shame. Uh, can everybody hear me? Is the microphone working? Good. Um, so what makes a Linux distribution? Uh, we take software that it gets written by these open source communities, many of them hobbyists, many of them professionals, um, many of them day trippers who, who just want to fix a bug, many of them um, long-term coders who spend years and years solving their particular itch. And we, we put them all together. So we take software from Linux, which is only the kernel that makes the software talk to the hardware. Uh, we take software from GNU and other projects that make the fundamental libraries and, and uh, command line tools. We take the graphics layer, which is uh, currently X, due to be replaced over the next few years. Um, and then we put an end user desktop on top of it, the sort of software that uh, casual users will actually see and care about. So in KDE, we've just launched our new desktop called Plasma 5. It is beautiful. It is gorgeous. It is shiny and, sh shiny and slick. It is available on the new release of Kubuntu. You should download it and try it now. Other desktops are available. And then we have applications, which we get from hundreds of other places upstream. Um, notable ones include Firefox for a web browser, LibreOffice for an Office suite, and the Dragons represent all the KDE applications uh, as a community. People who work within KDE to make hundreds of different applications that solve all the problems that everyday people need. Um, and then distributions like us, we take that software um, and make sure it all works together and put it on a disk for people to download and install and run and companies to use and uh, large organizations like, like city councils to roll out. So one of the oldest and best distributions is Debian. And uh, there's a few fans here today. And we, uh, in the Ubuntu project, we, we take Debian. And in their words, we add our own bugs. In our words, we add our own features. And within the Ubuntu project, there are a number of, number of distributions that get made. The flagship one is also called Ubuntu, slightly confusingly. And the one that I tend to work on is called Kubuntu. But it is all the same project. It is just a different selection of, of software. So this is a lot of stuff that has to work together. So the first thing that we need to interoperate with is ourselves, is all the different hundreds of different um, programs that all need to work together in a sensible way. And that's the, that's the role of us as distributions, is to make sure that the software that we're taking, that people are writing upstream, um, all works together sensibly. It doesn't. This isn't always the case. Often, I spend a lot of time filling in the gaps that people haven't noticed themselves. 
Um, and we have a, a project from that started about a decade ago, freedesktop.org, where, um, where whenever programs need to interoperate with each other, this project is a, has the normal open source methods, mailing lists, um, IRT channels, uh, bug reports, and so forth, uh, to work on shared specifications and also shared libraries. So the nice thing about any good standard needs multiple implementations in order to make sure, and ideally, a written specification. Life does not always work like that. Um, so often in free software, we will make a library um, which is shared between all programs. So that is uh, a nifty shortcut that we can take compared to the primary uh, proprietary world to have interoperability is just a shared programming library that all programs can use to make sure it all works. And so th this project was set up back in the day to, to solve obvious problems, like if you install an application, will it, will it tell the rest of the applications what types of file that it can open and so forth? So that, that was all done a decade ago. The desktop was functionally equivalent to uh, Windows or Mac as a desktop, and we were ready to take over the world. And we did take over Munich, which was an important part of the world. And in Munich, they, the city council there had um, they'd come to the end of life for whatever version of Windows they were running. They had to decide, do we spend millions of euro buying the next version of Windows, or can we do something else? They decided to change to Kubuntu, and they rolled out um, 15,000 machines, going up to 20,000 machines, or running Kubuntu. Um, and that successfully worked across the, the entire city that, that worked for everything that they had to, that they needed desktop computers to work for. Um, and this saved them, they reckon, around 11 million pounds just on the initial rollout, and that 11 million euro on the initial rollout, and that cost, that includes the cost of about uh, 2 million euro implementing it, which is a lot cheaper than would have been with Windows. Um, and the money st stayed in the local economy. So if you're a politician saying, why are we spending all the money? Very easy to justify it and say, well, we're saving 10 times that much, and the money stays in the local community. So it comes back to us as taxes or, or to our own citizens. So that's a really good success story um, that they've had. And the question is, why is this not happening everywhere else in the world? And to some extent, it is. Sorry. Uh, I've been around, I get invited around the world um, for other big rollouts like this. So I, I've been to, to Kano and, and Nigeria, and I've been to Bengaluru in India, and I have been to Tenerife, where they, they love this stuff. And it's really nice being able to sit on the beach and know that you're helping the, the people around you. I get invited to Google quite a lot. Google run all our uh, run all their computers on Ubuntu and, and Kubuntu, uh, which of course includes an awful lot of Ubuntu server, um, and they pay us back mostly in smoothies. So we, we are easily bought with good good quality smoothies. The Shah the Shah runs Kubuntu. So every time you watch the Hobbit or Lord of the Rings film, that's all made at Weta Digital in in New Zealand uh, on Kubuntu systems. So it's really nice when they occasionally make a a behind-the-scenes film um, showing how they, they make it, that all oh, the desktops are the same as my desktop because that's what I make. Um, and of course, they have 100,000 servers they're crunching us out to make it look pixel perfect, uh, which are all my software, which is great. Uh, but that's still, in terms of the number of big rollouts that I know of, I can still count them on, on two hands. So it has not yet taken over the world, which is a shame. And why not? Well, interoperability, Dad is the main reason. Um, most people, computers need to be able to talk to other computers, to people, to software, um, to any number of different things uh, in order to actually be useful. And people say, when, when they're thinking about should they install Kubuntu or some other Linux distribution, what's it going to work with? Will it work with this? Will it work with that? And the answer in 95% of cases now is yes, but often 95% is not enough. Uh, so the first thing that they ask is, uh, will it work with my applications? Can I, can I run Microsoft Office on it? And the answer typically is no. There's no particular reason 
why that should be the case, why programs won't run across different operating systems. Um, so that's the first slight barrier that people have, but we have good answers for that. We have good alternatives, including LibreOffice is a fantastic alternative to Microsoft Office. Um, and for almost any use case, niche ones and mass market ones, there will often be a, a equally good open source equivalent program. So Blender is a great 3D uh, rendering animation program. Krita is a great drawing painting application. It, it easily competes with the uh, proprietary alternatives. KDN Live we just released with KDE, that is a, a video application to do video editing. And the advantage, of course, of using these applications is if you have a problem, we have a community. So uh, there are active forums out there for people to ask for help. If you have a bug, then you can report it and often fix it. Somebody else will often fix it. Or if you have the skills, you can fix it yourself. Uh, many applications are also written in Qt within, within the KDE project. This is a technology that we use a lot. It's a programming library uh, that provides all the widgets that an application is made with. So programs programmed in Qt will work on a cross-platform. So any program that works on, that is designed to work as with the rest of the KDE programs will also equally compile on Windows and or Mac or Android or Windows Phone or whatever. So Krita there in the middle, painting application, although they're part of KDE, which is traditionally a Linux desktop project, most of their users now come from Windows because that's far more mass market. Um, but it works across all platforms. And we have Wine as well, which is an emulator, that, uh, not an emulator, a re-implementation of the Windows API. It works for, it, it doesn't usually give a great um, use case, but people like Munich use it occasionally when there are some niche program that only works on Windows and, and they use this to get it running on, on Linux desktops. And web applications is, means that often the operating system you have in front of you is of minimal importance. So in terms of interoperating with applications that people have on their computer, that's mostly a solved problem. Proprietary programs, we can do it a lot, lot better in terms of making them easy to install for the end user. Um, so these all work, Spotify works, Skype works. These are Spotify and Skype are both good examples of programs written in Qt, which means that um, the programmers can easily compile them across different, different operating systems. Uh, Steam is a games platform, and it was often a criticism of Linux that there weren't any computer games for people to play. But with Steam as a platform that's now available for Linux, that gives you uh, thousands of different computer games. So proprietary software um, mostly works, but because we can't include it typically in the main uh, Ar archives that we have within Ubuntu or other distributions. Um, support for it is a bit scratchy, it's a bit spotty, which is a shame. So the next question that people give us is, can I open my files? Okay, you can run LibreOffice. Can you open all the different um, files that I have for Microsoft Office? And for a long time, this was a big problem uh, back in the day. Microsoft Microsoft Office, of course, was the, the dominant file format. And, and the folks at LibreOffice have done a fantastic job of um, putting an awful lot of ro resources to make sure that they can read that and, and write to them successfully. But there's no reason why this should happen. There's no reason why this should be a closed format. In a, any other industry, this would be completely unacceptable. You would not buy a car and expect to have to go to a shell petrol station to fill up petrol in your car. You should expect to go to any petrol station. And there's no reason why this should not be standardized. And so a few years ago, uh, the good people at, at KDE, along with LibreOffice and others, uh, did work on, a, on standardizing the formats into open document format and successfully did that, which was great. And it went to ISO, so it's an international standard. It has that stamp of approval that many, many governments and users need. Um, but take up has been fairly slow by people because of fairly poor support within uh, Microsoft Office and other dominant players. And then Microsoft Office decided that instead of picking up the in 
the uh, international standard that has just been made, they would instead create another file format, which makes life more difficult for people who have to re-implement that. Uh, they threw a load of money at the standardized bodies so that they could call it a standard. Um, but of course, in reality, it's not. A standard should have multiple independent implementations, and Office Open didn't have that. Uh, so that is a danger that when governments get told you need to work with standards, that they go, oh, well, we do, we already work with whatever this thing is that we already work with. Um, now, I'm no fan of the UK government often. I voted last year to get rid of the UK government, but they have been really good recently in deciding that they want to work with the standard file format because that's a better way to run your economy to make sure that you have multiple different suppliers, um, all of whom work equally well with the, the products that people use. So hopefully the rest of the world will follow the UK government and use the open document uh, standard. So what else do we need to interoperate with? File formats mostly solve problem. Um, but there's a world outside computers. And everybody carries around a phone in their, in their uh, pocket. Um, wouldn't it be really great if the phone worked with a, with a computer that they tend to sit in front of at work? Uh, with a KDE, we have a nice program called KDE Connect, which is a program that you install on your desktop and another program on an Android phone. And that makes your computer integrate, interoperate with your desktop computer. It's a really nice setup. It means that if I'm sitting in the office with a with a phone there, somebody sends me a text message, it appears on my screen. Uh, if somebody calls me, then the number appears on my screen as well. And if I answer the call, then my computer is then clever enough to know that I have and to turn down the music while I'm speaking on the phone. I can share files and so forth. Uh, I can use it as a pointer to to control presentations, for example, or to play films if I. At home, I have a projector where I get to play films, but the computer is too far to reach. It's really nice remote control. So that's a really nice setup. We can also share files if over the NT MTP protocol. Um, but I have no idea how this works in the rest of the world. Those of us who tend to work in Linux desktop, we're, we're quite a niche of a niche. So we, we get quite in our bubble. And it is, would be really good to be here to work out how does the rest of the world integrate with their mobiles this KDE Connect system um, is designed to so that it can become an international standard. It can support multiple platforms. At the moment, it's just KDE and Android, but people are working on uh, Windows Phone, iPhone, and Windows and, and Mac uh, on the desktop. So it'd be really nice to see, can that fit in in the wider world? Or can, maybe if Microsoft are serious about interoperability, Maybe they want to make a Windows front end to talk to this. Mm, printers, so everyone's computer needs to work with a printer. Uh, for a long time, that was very difficult with Linux desktops. These days, it, it's pretty trivial. You can just plug it in, and, and almost all the time, the drivers will be there. There's a fairly standard format to do that. But there are still strange quirks. For example, the printer in my office, that is a wireless printer. Setting up that printer to actually talk to the network, you need to give it the... the the uh, access details of the wireless network. That works on some obscure proprietary protocol that nobody knows. But it only works with the Windows client. Um, and it doesn't. And that doesn't exist on Linux, of course, because it's not documented how it works. Uh, so that kind of third-party add-on, it would be really nice if, uh, if it was well documented, because if it was documented, the beauty of the open source community is that there will always be somebody around who wants to implement it on on their own favorite platform. There's no need to keep these things secret. Uh, people want to install install um, Kubuntu or whatever Linux distribution on their laptops, on their desktops, and they will expect it to work with the hardware. And it does 95% of the time, but there, there are still problematic bits of hardware. This is just as bad as with Windows. If you take a random computer, install Windows on it, 95% of it will work, but the other stuff you need to work out where are the drivers and so forth. Uh, but that isn't a problem in reality because people, there are enough OEMs that you can just buy a laptop with Windows pre-installed. Very few of those, sadly, with, with Linux. And so we have problems with people like NVIDIA who uh, 
make drivers, but they're, they're, they want to keep them proprietary, they want to keep them closed source. And that's illegal, unfortunately, because Linux is GPL, so you can't do that. And so we, in order to support NVIDIA hardware properly, we have to set it up so that you install the NVIDIA drivers after you're already running the Linux system because we can't ship them directly with it. And this is mm, the sort of difficult challenge that we have to work around purely for, uh, not for technical reasons, but purely for uh, for um, commercial reasons, um, which which causes a barrier to actually using the hardware. Um, installing on, on Apple hardware is, is often even more difficult because they're they use the latest and greatest and, and they really don't like telling anybody anything. Um, and people who use Apple hardware have a slightly higher expectation of everything working slick and smooth. Um, but of course, if you buy an Apple hardware just to install Linux on it, it seems like a waste of money to me. But we get quite a few complaints about that. The BIOS that is the inbuilt firmware that loads up your computer when you first turn it on uh, that hasn't changed since 1980 until a few years ago when uh, EFI became a new standard to, to work on that and I think Microsoft worked on that and they did a relatively nice job of, of making that a functional standard and a relatively nice job of documenting that. Um, the main problem in my experience though is that the implementations are buggy because they only test them with Windows. So I bought a Sony VAIO laptop and uh, install Ubuntu on it, and it kind of worked, but then when I wanted to reboot it again, it, it broke. And that's because this, this bit of um, firmware, they only test that with Windows. Um, they don't test it with anything else, and so of course bugs will creep in. That always is always the case. And so we get blamed for that, of course, because people see it as our fault, when uh, in reality it is somebody else's fault, and they're not interoperating with us. But that is that is what we have to live with. And then the worst half of that is Secure Boot, which is a very scary uh, specification where your computer will only boot an operating system which has been uh, cryptographically signed by somebody approved by Microsoft. So this is very, very scary because that, that means there's an inbuilt uh, necessity to have Microsoft around. Any way you want to run an economy, it is not a good way to have a monopoly, which hopefully Microsoft are not anymore, and that's why they're all here, nice and lovely and friendly. But this is nevertheless forcing them to be part of um, part of uh, the the technology ecos ecosystem, even if they're even if they go out of business, we will still have to give them money. It means that large companies like Red Hat and Canonical can have to put in a lot of resources in order to work out how to how to persuade Microsoft that they can sign the operating system so that people can actually run Ubuntu on their hardware and it means that smaller projects like our own um, have an even more difficult time because we don't have the resources to so talk to Microsoft to buy whatever needs to be bought to be able to digitally sign our operating system. So we're actively being kept out of, of the, the simple pre-market economics of uh, being able to choose and change and do whatever you want. And this is a really scary part of the technology world today. So this conference is mostly about protocols. Uh, groupware is something that everybody will want their computer to be able to use. Uh, email is a fairly standardized uh, setup. The protocols there are well understood. Uh, calendaring, not quite so much. There are a few protocols out there. Um, address books, there's LDAP out there. Um, but of course, much of the world uses Active Directory, I guess. Um, in KDE, we have good relationship with George over here, who does Colab, who will be talking at some point mañana. Um, and, and Colab is really nice setup as a server, and they use the KDE contact client as their primary client. Um, and that means that we can use, we can, people can share calendars and address books and uh, email um, as they would expect. Um, but of course, there's no reason why Colab shouldn't be able to use standard protocols. For the most part, it does, right? It uses WebDAV. But there are still extensions that need to be added on to that, um, which means that, um, well, for it means that they have to work with us, whereas they could just say, we're using the standards in an ideal world. 
they would just say, we're using the standards. And we would say, we're using the standards. We'll talk to each other. So there are standards for calendaring, iCalendar, and uh, CalDAV, but there, there's probably very good reasons why these are insufficient for people to use much in the real world. And an awful lot of people in the real world don't have their own collab set up or, or even exchange set up. Um, they, they will just use Google Calendar or, or uh, whatever the equivalent is from, from Hotmail or Yahoo or whatever. And, and our, uh, our group or our program, which is called Contact, that does talk to Google, uh, Google Calendar, but it, it's a very specific implementation. Um, there's, it's very hard to, if Google have to change their protocol, then it, then it means that we tend to lag behind. And it's a real shame that the world doesn't have these nice, simple standards that everyone can follow. But of course, there's no such thing as a simple standard. It's a very difficult thing to make sure that everybody talks to everybody. Uh, so we need to talk to people. And if we are to take over the world, as I'm hoping to do, then uh, we need to talk whatever their language is. And this is something that we excel at in Linux desktops, uh, because people are enthusiastic about Linux desktops, and people are enthusiastic about whatever languages they speak. So it means that if there is um, a fairly minority language, um, maybe Asturias or um, Aragonese, then there will very often be somebody who's enthusiastic enough to translate all our software into, into their language. Uh, so the Catalans are, are right on top of it. Whenever I write an announcement before the end of the day, that will be translated into Catalan, which I'm fairly confident in saying beats the socks off anything from, from any other supplier in terms of the number of languages, both very, very popular and common languages, and another of number of minority languages, um, the Catalans will, I'm not talking about Catalan, that's very much a majority language because that has millions of speakers, but, but for example, uh, Valencian is, is, you could say is more minority, um, but uh, equally that all our software gets translated into Catalan Valenciao because there are people who are enthusiastic to do that and they do an excellent job of doing that. So where's the Aragon translation is what I, what I want to know from the Zentio people. People also expect um, people expect their software to work in a way that is fairly familiar. It shouldn't change dramatically where, the, where there's no need for it to change. And so in KDE, we've just launched our shiny new desktop product, Plasma 5. It's slick and shiny. Things move around. It's got widgets that you can play with. Uh, you can make funny, funky barcodes. Um, but the layout still retains the familiar Windows 95 layout from 20 years ago because it works. People like it. It's functional. Um, and there's no particular problem to fix there. And we, we've got quite a lot of credit for just retain, retaining that layout because a lot of other projects like GNOME here or uh, Unity, which is part of Ubuntu, have changed the layout, the, the basic setup of the desktop. And uh, that gives them a bit of an advantage and it gives them a bit of, um, a, bit of a, a unique appeal. But most people, I, I rarely see people saying that they love the new setup from GNOME or, or the new setup from from Windows 8, for example, rarely see people saying that they really love that, that change. So what we've done with the Plasma 5 is keep the default layout uh, the same as people are familiar with, but it's very customizable. So people can, people, certain type of user will love to change the, the default layout and the default theming, and, and you can do all that, of course. Mensaheria instantania, is that right? Instant messaging is uh, very much a set of protocols that we need to interoperate with because people using their desktop computers want to be able to talk to their friends. That, that's a really useful um, outcome of computing in the last decade or so. Um, and this is a constantly evolving, it's a very difficult area to actually implement because the, the companies that people are interested in change every few years. Uh, the protocols that go with that change even more frequently. The features within those protocols change even more frequently. Um, we offer some of the best instant messaging in terms of end user uh, setup because if you have your Linux desktop, you can set up your instant messenger and that will talk to uh, Google, uh, Microsoft Messenger, uh, uh, Jabber, ICQ, AOL, uh, Gabu Gabu, which I think is popular in Poland and whatever the one that's popular in China is. So we offer really integrated 
uh, instant messaging. But different protocols change over time. This used to be a really nice story. There was a standard XMPP that seemed like it was going to become the, the industry standard across everything. And a number of players took that up, like Google and Facebook. But Facebook just this month have, have dropped that. So we can no longer offer Facebook integration, which is the market leader in terms of instant messaging, which is a bit of a killer for us in terms of people saying, why should I change to uh, your desktop? So an interesting message, if there's anybody from Microsoft with contacts on Skype, if Skype wants to get back in front as, as the instant messaging um, standard, XMPP, or some other API that we can use, is a great way to make sure that more people can talk to more people. And of course, that gets you ahead in, in terms of that game or in terms of that industry. Compartiendo uh, los equipos, sharing files, which is probably what this, this talk was built as, SMB uh, file sharing. Um, we are we have the excellent team from Samba who do an excellent job of implementing that in terms of sharing to um, Windows or, or elsewhere. It's kind of an industry standard. Um, but actually, in our fault, we haven't quite implemented that in such a slick and reliable way as I would be happy with, which is what I want to work on over the next couple of days, making sure that um, that you can just share files over SMB. I have solved this problem before. But uh, bit rot happens, and, and bits of computer programs suddenly don't necessarily work with each other. So I have a, a student with Google Summer of Code who will work on making sure that works properly in, uh, in Ubuntu and across other KDE desktops. Um, but I tend to consider SMB to be a, a not a very elegant uh, solution to the problem, because it, it's how many Samba developers does it take to implement it an awful lot. Um, so it's a, a shame that there are no good alternatives out there. Um, WebDAV is one of them, as a that's an extension to HTTP on the web browser, and we use that and offer that quite a lot. Um, but again, the number of people using that is not it hasn't got the crit critical mass that people care about it too much. Um, one project that came from KDE is OwnCloud. Um, so of course, it's very fashionable recently to use uh, Google Docs, and, and Microsoft will have an equivalent in terms of applications through a web browser. People often don't like that, because that um, costs a lot of money. Um, GCHQ and other spy agencies will spy on you. Uh, so OwnCloud is a nice suite of programs to run on your server. Uh, that gives you file sharing, office edi file editing, uh, picture sharing, music sharing, uh, a whole bunch of different online applications. And they talk nice standard protocols to uh, desktop software on KDE. Um, WebDAV in terms of file sharing. Uh, CalDAV is the, the calendar standard. Um, CardDAV, I believe, is for sharing address books. Uh, so that integrates really nicely with all the desktop. Um, so yes, we are KDE. We, uh, we make beautiful software on the desktop. Um, we are having a conference in a couple of months in, in A Coruña. Uh, do come along. We're looking for a keynote speaker. So if somebody from Microsoft or somebody else wants to persuade us that they're open to interoperate with, with the Linux desktop, then that would be fantastic. Um, but we have not yet taken over the world. And for all these reasons that we don't quite interoperate with everything, for reasons which are partly our fault, we don't necessarily have the manpower to do it, the person power to do it, and are partly the fault of the people that we need to interoperate with, because they, they don't make it easy for us to do that. Um, so hopefully this time next year, that will be a solved problem, and we'll be on our way to world domination. Thank you. Any questions? Microphone, somebody. For the video. Um, I, w I was um, interested in how um, the Council of Immun Munich is doing now with Linux, because I read some news that they most probably want to roll back to Windows. Is this true? Is this a no. hoax? Or uh, last year, maybe 18 months ago, they had elections, everybody was on holiday, the newspapers wanted a story, and the mayor wanted wanted something to work with his phone, and somebody didn't 
set it up in time and he couldn't work out how to get his computer to talk to his phone himself. So he said, no, this Linux stuff is rubbish, maybe we should switch back to Windows. Possibly influenced by Microsoft saying, we'll move our German headquarters into Munich if you switch back to Windows. Um, but I'm pleased to say that they still, they invited us back to Munich, we could tend to go there annually, they, they have a nice meeting slash party there. Um, and we went back there and they're still busy as ever rolling it out into, into more computers and they're planning to do that for the next decade or so. Okay, great. Hi, uh, do you have a VDI solution based on Ubuntu? A what solution? Uh, VDI, virtual desktop. Virtual desktop. Uh, yes, think client. Think client solutions. Yes, uh, Linux terminal server project uh, is a project to... There, there are all sorts of uh, protocols, again, that, that needs working in order to be a functional solution. Linux terminal server project is the project that takes all those together and makes sure that it all works. Um, our colleagues in Ubuntu, uh, Ed Ubuntu, focus on making sure that works because that's quite a common use case for schools to have a thin server set up. Um, and I believe it works very well but I haven't tried it myself in recent years. But yes, we do. Estudo? Muchas gracias. Adiós.